All right. Uh, hello, students. Welcome to another uh, video lecture for ComSci 125 operating systems. In this video, we're going to talk about common concurrency problems. So at this point, we already know what concurrency is all about and the issues that we need to handle when we have concurrent programs. But before we proceed to the discussion of this chapter, let's uh, let's have a short review of uh, what we talked about last time in the previous chapter. So, uh, in the previous chapter, our, our focus was on the semaphore. Right? So it's actually a synchronization primitive that has just an integer value. And this integer value is manipulated by two operations. The weight operation and the post operation. Same weight and same post. And using this, uh, two, uh, this primitive semaphore, we are able to use this as locks and also as condition variables. And in the previous chapter, we also talked about some of the classic synchronization problems like the uh, producer-consumer problem and the uh, dining philosopher's problem. And we use the semaphore to solve these uh, problems. We also talked about uh, thread throttling and the uh, implementation of semaphores, which actually uses the lock primitive and the condition variable primitive. So let's continue now to this topic on common concurrency problem. So uh, initially, you will have really a hard time programming concurrent programs or multi-threaded programs. So starting writing these types of programs will be difficult but eventually you'll get you'll get the hang of it and sometimes even though you think you're confident that your program is correct there are possibilities that your program may actually be wrong especially if you have concurrent program so this chapter addresses these common problems that are encountered by programmers when they are developing concurrent programs so the textbook referenced a, a research that characterized different uh, or common concurrency problems. And the idea is to this paper cited in the textbook used uh, real code basis actual actual open source projects and they examine the common uh, concurrency problems that are present in this uh, open source commonly used software so in the study it was uh, determined that there are two or actually not determined, uh, they took note of two common concurrency problems. They categorized uh, this as non-deadlock and the other one uh, deadlock uh, problem. And their samples, samples include MySQL, which is a database management system, Apache, which is a web server, Zilla, I think it's Firefox, it's a web browser, and 
open office, which is an office uh, productivity suite. And uh, they identified these uh, towns in terms of the concurrency problem encountered. And they observed that majority actually are non-deadlock related problems. In the, total, in the total of their uh, study, 74 bugs were related, were non-deadlock bugs, while uh, 31 bugs are deadlock bugs. Okay, so it pays to, it, it's important to realize that most concurrency bugs are actually non-deadlock bugs. So somehow at least we don't need to uh, burden ourselves with uh, actually solving deadlock problems because there are uh, non-deadlock problems which are more common in the software that are being written. Now, let's talk about uh, non-deadlock bugs. Okay. So it says that it makes up the majority of concurrency bugs. And there are two types. Uh, in the paper, we have first atomic atomicity violation and the other one uh, order violation. So let's start with uh, atomicity violation. So this has something to do with uh, mutual uh, exclusion. So the idea here is the desired serializability among multiple memory accesses is violated. So basically you have a shared variable and then a lot of threads are accessing this shared variable. And ideally, the, the order of this, uh, the access of this memory variable should be well defined. But unfortunately, due to coding errors, some uh, programmers might forget about it. So for example, we have uh, a bug they found in MySQL, wherein two different threads access the proc info structure in the struct uh, THD. So this is how the code looks like. So we have two threads, thread one and thread two. In thread one, there is a check if uh, proc info is exists, basically if it exists or none is if it's non-zero. You know, you know already the definition of the if statement. Then we also have another uh, thread, thread two which also accesses the same structure, proc info, but it sets this to null. So imagine the scenario wherein thread one is running on the CPU and then it just executed this line of code. Then at this point, thread two suddenly executes. So what will happen is this proc info will be set to null. So what will happen is Let's say after context switch, the control now, the CPU now executes thread one and it executes this line. So it tries to uh, read uh, this structure, this, uh, this value, but unfortunately it was set to null by the second thread. So that is actually a problem because of, uh, of this scenario. So, Ideally, this should not happen, but it is present in the MySQL tool. So how do we solve this uh, type of uh, atomicity violation problem, atomicity va violation bug? So we introduce, as we know already, we introduce a lock. So we have here a pthread mutex, and then we protect the critical section with the locks. The same with the thread two. So this way we are able to uh, solve this particular uh, problem. 
So let's take a look at uh, some gold. I think we have some example here. Okay. So looking at this uh, folder, okay, so we can uh, make it builds everything. Okay, so we're interested in atomicity. So let's try. Let's open this code. So this is a simulation of the problem uh, discovered in the MySQL code. So we have two structures here, rock T and thread info T. And then we have thread one. So this is the code that accesses uh, proc info THD. And then uh, Critical section, basically, this is the critical section and thread two. Okay, this is the part that sets to sets the uh, that sets the structure to none. Right, okay? and then we have the main the main code, which basically creates a thread and uh, joins. Okay, right? so let's uh, try this code. So as you can see, because of uh, this uh, atomicity violation, we get this uh, segmentation fault. So most likely this is because of uh, this part here being set to null and then thread one trying to access this information. Now there is a fix for this. So this is the fixed code. And as you can see, the main difference is by uh, sandwiching the critical section to a lock. So you have lock and lock. The same with uh, thread uh, two. So when we run the code, so we got no problem. So that particular uh, problem is fixed already, right? So great. Let's go back to the slides. All right, so that's one problem, violation of atomicity, but we are able to solve it by uh, introducing, sandwiching the critical section uh, between uh, lock and unlock. So the next uh, non-deadlock bug is order violation bugs. So in this type of bugs, the desired order uh, between two memory accesses is uh, flipped. Right? For example, uh, A should always be executed before B, but the order is not enforced during execution. So remember that the scheduler plays an important role in the scheduling of the threads. Although we might assume that A will execute first and then B, it's possible that the scheduler may not might not do that. So it's really difficult to make such assumption. So here we have uh, an example code. Okay. Uh, the code in thread two seems to assume that the variable M thread has already been initialized and is not null. So uh, you have thread two here and you have the main here and then it assumes that uh, this S thread okay, has already been initialized when in fact it hasn't been. Okay. So again, this will be a problem because there is no check here. As you can see there is no check here whether uh, M thread has already been or M thread has already been created. Right? So it just assumes that uh, this 
call right, uh, was executed first before this one. So that means thread one before executing uh, this in thread two, thread one already has done this step. Right? So that's a problem because we cannot assume that it depends again on the thread scheduler. So what is the solution? I, so we know this already as uh, in the previous uh, chapters when we talked about uh, condition variables because we can actually uh, enforce some ordering uh, in the thread execution by using condition variables. So here we have, uh, again, uh, if you use uh, condition variables, you need to have a lock. And then you have to initialize the lock and then you have the condition variable, you have to initialize it also. And for thread one, okay, so uh, first let's uh, go to thread two first because this is the one that uses the, the thread, right? So here, what we do, this is the common pattern when writing condition variables. First, we create the lock and then uh, you notice already that we need to use a loop when using condition variable. And this is the condition of flag, this is the flag value. So remember also that when using condition variables, we need to use a flag, a state uh, variable. So this one is empty in it, meaning the M thread has been initialized, so initially set to zero. So what we want to do here is to check whether uh, to continue, okay, to continue waiting uh, while the M thread is not yet initialized. So that's why we have the while loop here. And then we have this uh, wait on the condition variable. Okay. So meaning thread two is waiting for thread one to create the thread and then to obtain the lock, set the state variable empty in it to one, and then signal thread two that uh, it is already done okay, and then unlock. So it will wait the uh, thread to which is waiting on this condition variable. So this solves the problem of uh, uh, this problem on order violation, right? Because thread to waited for thread one to allocate the thread. Uh, yeah, empty thread. So let's uh, let's check if there's a code here okay. ordering let's try ordering ordering let's see so this uh, book by Renzi is good because it has all the source code available from the available on the github repository of of his uh, uh his uh GitHub repository or GitHub account. So this is the code. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, create uh, create thread use. Okay. And then let's just look at the okay. so this is the M main. Right. So this is the code that tries to access M thread. Okay. And this is so essentially in this in this in this actual code, this working code, the this is the main uh, the main thread. Okay. This is the main as I told you already that this is the main thread, and this is where the Peter trade is uh, created. And then. Uh, it assumes that uh, this M thread is created already, right? So this part here, right? So let's uh, check the execution of this support code. So as you can see, there is a segmentation core dump error here, right? So most likely it's because of uh, a null the reference. So this is probably that part. Uh, this is probably that part that causes the segmentation fault. So 
Uh, let's take a look at the fixed code. Right? So the fixed code is actually accomplished by uh, using condition variable. Right? So you have a condition variable and you have a lock and then you have the state uh, variable here. So in the main, okay, so we get then obtain the lock and then uh, this is the M main. Okay, uh, do the wait and then do the unlock and then update the only then the this thread can update the, the state. Okay? And uh, for the main thread, which is the thread one, so this will be the, the code. So let's take a look at the execution of this fixed code. And you can see that there is no segmentation fault that is occurring because essentially what happens is we fix this. We fix the ordering violation. Main is uh, uh, or M main is now waiting for M uh, for the actual main to create the thread. Okay, so that uh, fixes our uh, order violation. So we just finished discussing the non-deadlock bugs. Now let's talk about uh, deadlock bugs. So this is a common uh, bug or a common cause of deadlock in a code by the programmer. So you have uh, here So you have two threads, we have thread one and we have thread two. So thread one uh, calls, uh, tries to obtain the lock L1 and then next it tries to obtain the lock L2. While thread two tries to obtain the lock L2 and then next is try to obtain the lock L1. So this is the case, uh, if you recall our discussion on the dining philosopher's problem, this is what happens. You can think of L1 and L2 as the forks of the philosopher. So thread one is philosopher one, thread two is philosopher two, L1 is the left fork, or, 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 or L2 is the or right fork, okay, so something like that. And we can visually, uh, we can visually uh, represent this interaction using this diagram. So we have the thread holds lock one, and then thread two is waiting uh, for lock one to be released by thread one. So essentially this is a graph, and you know in your discrete mathematics course that this graph has a cycle. So. So usually uh, in other textbooks, it's called uh, resource allocation graph. Resource allocation graph. So that's uh, how it's called and usually when, if you can represent the threads and the resources right, and if you detect a cycle you get a a dead lock that's uh, what happens so how do you how do you solve this uh, problem in the dining philosopher's problem we solve this the deadlock problem by making sure that the fifth philosopher will not uh, try to obtain the forks from left first and then right fork. So we change the order for the last philosopher to choose the, to, to obtain, to try to obtain the right fork first before the left fork. So in that way, we try to break the cycle because uh, 
of that technique. So the question, that, an interesting question is, uh, why do deadlocks occur? Why uh, this scenario happens when it comes to resource resources and uh, threads? One reason is uh, in large code in large code bases, there are complex dependencies that arise between components. If you have an operating system, for example, if you have a database management system, for example, so there are a lot of components interacting and uh, you never know the dependencies that might uh, eventually uh, uh, come about or arise in their interaction. For example, in an operating system, the virtual memory manager or virtual memory management subsystem will of course talk to the file system because for example uh, swapping needs to be to be done right and eventually the file system will also have to talk to the virtual memory subsystem right so this interaction might result to a deadlock even though initially the design was not uh was not like that now, for the second reason, uh, the idea of encapsulation, right? So, encapsulation is good, as you know already, in ComSci 22, object oriented programming. So, you try to package a component with a concrete functionality and uh, expose the functionality of that component via a specific uh, interface right and if this uh, under under the hood of that of that uh, component you actually don't know what uh, what is happening right and you never know what the interaction might happen so that's uh, another uh, reason why that lacks can occur although encapsulation is uh, a good uh, software engineering concept so such modularity does not mesh well with uh, locking. Uh, an example given is the in Java. Right? So in Java, probably uh, you're familiar with the vector class, which is basically just uh, a list. And this type of list is uh, thread safe. Right? So that means that uh, the vector class uh, allows multiple threads to access, to manipulate uh, its contents, right? And one problem is, for example, the add all method of the vector class. Let's say you have this example, we have uh, two vectors, V1 and V2, and then V1 uh, calls the add all V2, uh, add all method passing V2 vector two. Right. So the goal is to add the contents of vector 2 to vector 1. So locks for both the vector being added to v1 and the parameter v2 need to be acquired. Right. So these locks need to be acquired since, uh, again, vector class is thread safe. Right. So if uh, some other thread calls v2 add v2 that add all v1, right. so the, the, the opposite. Okay, so there is a potential for a deadlock, right? So that is uh, another reason why deadlocks can happen. So formally, let's describe or discuss the conditions. Uh, it should be conditions for a deadlock. There are four conditions for a uh, deadlock to occur, mutual exclusion, hold and wait, no preemption, and circular wait. These conditions are important because if we want to prevent deadlocks from happening, all we have to do is to violate at least one of these conditions so that the deadlock will not happen. Right? So mutual exclusion means that threads claim exclusive control of resources that they record, meaning uh, the system requires the threads to 
um, requires the threads to have exclusive access to a resource. Right? So there should be mutual exclusion. Second, hold and wait. The threads hold resources allocated to them while waiting for additional resources. In the case of the example earlier, so hold and wait, thread one, for example, it was able to acquire lock one, but it's still waiting to acquire lock two. So that's hold and wait. It's holding a resource while waiting for this another resource. Then the next one is no preemption, the third one. Resources cannot be forcibly removed from threads that are holding them. For example, if you hold a lock, okay, you need to call a lock to release that particular resource. So that's no preemption. And then circular weight, uh, there exists a circular chain of threads that's such that each thread holds one more resources that are being requested by the next thread in the chain. So that's circular weight. Basically, this is the cycle in uh, the resource allocation graph. So this is, uh, just consider this uh, scenario. Right? Try to think about whether all the conditions for a deadlock are present in this particular example. Right? So there is uh, mutual exclusion. There is a uh, hold and wait. There is no preemption. And there is a circular, uh, circular way. Right? So those are the four conditions that must be present for a deadlock to occur. So in order to prevent uh, the deadlock, we need to violate at least one of these conditions. Now, the first one is let's try to violate a circular weight. Again, circular weight will try to have, uh, there's an existing dependency, right? So what can be done uh, to prevent deadlock by violating circular weight is to impose an ordering on the lock acquisition. This means that thread one will get the lock first, then thread two, so you specify an ordering. So you need to design uh, to design a good uh, locking strategies and basically the uh, locks are global. So for example, there are two locks in the system, L1 and L2. We can prevent deadlock by always acquiring L1 before L2. So you you, you try to impose some ordering okay, on the access of the, or the acquisition of the resource. Now, how about hold and wait? How do we violate uh, hold and wait. Hold and wait is a thread has a resource and it needs another resource. So a solution is to acquire all the lock at once atomically. Okay, so here is uh, an example. Okay, so you have the lock prevention uh, lock and then Within this lock prevention lock, you acquire all the locks needed by the by the particular thread. Okay, so this code guarantees that no untimely thread switch can occur in the midst of lock acquisition. So this uh, this uh, this two here guards ensures that no other thread can try to acquire the required locks. Okay. The problem with this is that it requires us to know uh, when calling a routine exactly which locks must be held to acquire them ahead of time. So sometimes our system does not have this uh, pre-knowledge of the locks that we're going to need. So it's quite difficult to implement uh, violating uh, hold and wait. And also in doing so, we decrease concurrency because uh, one thread will try to obtain the locks, all the locks, although at some point they might not even need these locks yet. Right? So it decreases the concurrency. Then the last one is no preemption. Uh, the third one is no preemption. So what do we, again, uh, no preemption meaning uh, 
When we say no preemption, resources cannot be forcibly removed from threads that are holding them. So in the case of the lock, you cannot just uh, uh, forcibly take the lock out of uh, a thread that holds the lock. So you that that thread has to call unlock. So uh, what can be done is to uh, use another function called try lock, right? So this try lock is used to build a deadlock free ordering uh, robust uh, application uh, acquisition uh, lock acquisition protocol. So what it does is uh, if the lock is available, it grabs it immediately. However, if at that point where it tries to grab the lock, it was not able to do to do so, it returns immediately and a negative one is returned. So this is the sample code for that. So we have a label here, tap colon, and then try, uh, try to, uh, this is uh, get, obtain the lock L1. And then here, instead of lock L2, it uses try lock, right? So such that uh, if it tries to attempt to get L2 but fails to do so, which means that it gets a negative one, uh, it will unlock L1, right? release this uh, lock, and then go back again. So this is the idea of uh, no preemption. Right? So. that is the, uh, the the scenario okay to be able to prevent deadlock we can uh, have this we can use this try lock now we also have a term uh we have a deadlock so we have live lock right so in a deadlock uh the there's there's no system uh there's no system uh, uh, progress that is happening right there's no uh progress right so in a live lock two threads might be running through the code sequence acquiring the lock over and over again but failing to acquire the lock so as, uh, as shown here so this might uh continue uh indefinitely right so it seems like actual work being done here which is basically just lock acquisition uh but it always fails okay so so it's called a live lock because uh it seems like actual progress but it's actually not actual progress it's simply uh, lock acquisition so that's the idea of a live lock so uh this is the part where in the threads are busy acquiring the lock but Actually, they're not making progress because uh, the locks are never acquired. Okay, so the solution is to introduce a random delay before looping back and tying the entire thing uh, over, over again, over uh, another another round. So introduce a random uh, a random delay, a random sleep, for example. That's for the uh, live lock. Okay, and the last one is uh, to prevent a dead lock. Uh, we need to violate mutual exclusion, but oftentimes in some systems we can't do this, right? Because uh, some uh, parts of our program will will actually require mutual exclusion. Because otherwise, if we don't have mutual exclusion, then race condition might happen. We can say, okay, we prevented deadlock, but race condition can uh, can happen. So it's not actually a good solution to. Uh, violate or prevent mutual exclusion in order to prevent a deadlock from happening. So, but we can uh, do that by using uh, a lock-free or weight-free uh, approach wherein we don't use locks, right? We don't use locks, but rather we use the basic operations. The hardware instructions used to build the locks, right? the atomic instructions. And data structures can be built uh, without actually using the lapping abstraction, the abstraction of a lap. So here is an example of, uh, we discussed this already in the implementation of the locks. So we have the compare and swap instruction. 
for a processor and this one is uh, atomic meaning everything in this is executed un uninterrupted everything here uh, is that uh, it cannot be interrupted right so using this uh, instruction uh, it can be used to for example uh, this one is to increment uh, some value with a given amount okay so it can do this uh it can do this uh this code can be done without using lux okay but rather directly invoking the uh, instruction the hardware the atomic instruction which is the compare and uh, swap right it's actually the if you recall this is the xchg uh instruction in the x86 uh, architecture isa right so uh what it does is so you have a do a do while loop then what it does is to up tries to update the value to the new amount and uses the compare and swap to do so so here there we have no lock as you can see there is no call to lock and then lock uh, no deadlock uh, can arise because uh, we prevent. Uh, we still have. Uh, there's no no concept of uh, mutual exclusion in this particular problem. So there is no uh, mutual exclusion, uh, but we are but we are able to solve the the race condition problem. No mutual exclusion, but we are able to solve the race condition problem because of using this atomic instruction and then of course we have still uh, a live lock possibility because again uh, this loop can the, the cpu can uh, uh, indefinitely uh, loop in this uh, in this block of code so there's still a possibility of a live lock so for example this one uh is an assertion of of a node so let's say uh, in a list so we have the insert a function and the new value first you have to allocate a node and then make sure that the node is allocated and then uh, you set the value the value of the new node to the past value and then you insert it at the head so uh, next one is uh, the next node of the new node is the head and then head is uh, set to the new node so insert at head right so uh, if uh, called by multiple threads at the same time of course this will be there will be a race condition so if a lot of threads try to call insert of course there will be a race condition in this particular uh, critical section right so solution is to uh of course to uh, surround uh that with lock right so by now i suppose you're already comfortable with using locks to guard critical sections of code and uh, it can also be done using the weight free approach right so how is this done right so you have uh, malloc assert okay and then you set the value and then i right, simply uh perform the compare and swap this will work because uh basically it's just pointer addition right? pointer arithmetic pointer addition so memory address addition so this will uh actually work right so yes that's uh for solving this uh, to, uh preventing uh deadlock by eliminating uh, mutual uh, exclusion so so those uh four approaches uh, prevents deadlock right another approach to manage to hunting deadlock is called uh, deadlock avoidance and this is accomplished via scheduling right so the idea here is uh you allow the four conditions of the deadlock to happen right but you do some uh you do some 
uh, uh, monitoring okay, in the system so that uh, you'll have you will be able to avoid the possibility of having a deadlock right and for this to to work you, uh the sys uh the the system that avoids deadlock okay there should be there should be some global not knowledge for example uh which locks uh various threads might grab during their execution so uh, this this should be known to this uh, to the deadlock avoidance module and subsequently schedules a uh, set threads in a way to guarantee no deadlock can occur right? so this deadlock avoidance module can be integrated into the scheduler actually as shown as we did, as will be shown in the succeeding slides so So here's an example. Again, it requires uh, a priori or uh, prior knowledge of the resources that the threads will need. For example, thread one. So in, in this example system, we have uh, we have two processors, two cores, and four threads. So we have thread one, thread two, thread three, and thread four, and then. Uh, these threads will use two locks. Uh, there, there are two locks in the system. And thread one will use lock one and lock two. Thread two will use lock one and lock two also. Thread three will not use lock one, but it will use lock two. And thread four will not use uh, these locks. So what the scheduler does to avoid dead lock is to schedule the processes in this manner so on cpu1 it will schedule t3 and t4 and on cpu2 it will schedule t1 and t2 right so as long as uh, t1 and t2 are not run at the same time so t1 t2 here no deadlock coca could ever arise right? because these are the two threads that require uh both the both locks one lock uh, both lock one and lock two okay so that's uh the avoidance technique okay so another example would be uh we simply change the we simply change the lock usage so uh, in this scenario t3 will now use l1 like in this one a t3 will not use l1 so here uh <clears throat> this will be the schedule that will be made in order to avoid deadlock so a cpu1 okay simply put t4 there and then cpu2 will be t1 t2 and uh, t3 so doing this uh, these three these three threads that will contend for locks one and two uh, will not be in a deadlock state. Right? However, the uh, completion time, of course, will be uh, longer compared to this one, which is up to this point. This is the duration of the execution of the tasks. Well, this one. Uh, you have a longer uh, completion time. Okay, so another one is to uh, detect and recover. I think I don't know. This is the last one. So in the detect and recover, okay. So you simply allow the uh, in the system. The system simply allows the a deadlock to happen, but it takes. Uh, there is a a process that tries to check if a deadlock has occurred okay and then recover from for example if the os uh, freezes then we simply reboot the the system right so so most developers kernel developers will not concern themselves about deadlocks because as as was presented earlier most bugs are actually not the lock related 
So, okay, let's allow uh, deadlocks to happen, but when the system freezes, uh, there's a deadlock, so we simply reboot the, the, the system. Or if we have a process, we simply press Control c okay? For example, in the dining philosopher's problem, if your implementation uh, does not address deadlock and uh, you, think, you think that the system or the simulation hung already, you can press Control c to stop the simulation because there is no more progress, right? Uh, with database systems also, okay? So we talked about uh, readers and writers also in the previous uh, chapter okay, for databases. So it's also possible for deadlocks to happen, right? So uh, what is done in most databases is to run a deadlock detector and it basically builds a resource allocation graph, right? And then if a deadlock is detected, then the system will need to be uh, restarted. But usually this, ha this uh, happens very rarely. Okay, so I guess that's the end of this chapter. So let's take a look at some code. If, uh, Let's take a look at some deadlock code. Okay, so we have a deadlock here. Let's take a look at the code. Okay, so we have two locks, L1 and L2. Okay, so thread one tries to acquire the lock. And then it tries to first lock, and then tries to acquire the second lock, and then do the unlock. And then thread two uh, tries also to acquire uh, lock two, okay? And then uh, tries to acquire lock one, and then unlock L L one and L two. So it's a pretty simple example. Uh, So deadlock shows a simple two-cycle uh, deadlock until you hit a deadlock and are convinced that the deadlock can go. So let's take a look at that code. So it 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 uh it uh continuously loops to run the deadlock. So let's see. Uh, okay, so it continues to run the, uh, it runs the code repeatedly until we uh, probably hit a deadlock at some point. So you can experiment with this code and uh, hopefully, probably when you did or when you wrote the lab on writing, implementing your own uh, dining philosopher's uh, problem uh, simulation, you got to observe the deadlock happening. So as you can see in this example, okay, uh, begin, thread one, try to acquire L1, and then, so this is the main, this is the main begin. So then T2 begin, Okay, it's trying to acquire L2. Uh, it was able to acquire L2. Then uh, T1 begins and trying to acquire L1. And it was able to acquire L1, but it's trying to acquire L2. But since it's trying to acquire L2, thread 2 already acquired thread uh, L2. Okay. So you see the deadlock ha happening here, right? So T2 is trying to acquire L1 at this point, but um, L1 is already acquired by T1. So there is uh, a cycle in the dependency graph, the resource allocation graph. So thus we have here the system hangs. So again, we allow the system to, to have a deadlock. So for what we do now is to detect and 
restart. Okay, so you press Control C to stop the process. Okay, so that will be the end for this uh, chapter. See you on the next chapter.